Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Howdy. My name is Chris Ray. Very grateful recovered alcoholic. Let me. This is this is going to be good. Um, I tell you what, we're going to try to accomplish here. Okay, and so, like I said, best laid plans. You know, <laughs> we'll probably all go to hell in a handbasket. But we're gonna. This is what we're going to try to do anyway. We uh, uh, we want to try to do today. We want to try to go through the the twelve steps from a standpoint of of taking a newcomer through the steps. Now. I know some of you guys, you've had a sponsor sit down and read the book to you, and, and how cool is that, and and, and we're not going to do that. And so we're going <laughs> to, one of the biggest problems that we see in our fellowship today is that we've lost our sense of urgency, and we're going to talk a lot about that. And, and there, there's a, there's a, um, I'm going to kind of give you a little overview here, um, and then we're going to allow... Charlie and Katie to kind of elaborate. We're gonna we're gonna do like a step at a time, and we're gonna and then we'll move on to the next uh, step. Uh, it should be pretty simple to do. One of the things that we're gonna ask you guys to do is again with the questions is like bef- before. Uh, I don't know how to explain this. If, if you ask a question at the end of this, we're gonna be able to answer that for you. We'll repeat the question for the tape so that it'll be on there. But what we would ask you to do, guys, is get to cut to the chase with these questions. I know a lot of you guys have done ask it baskets and the guy gets up and starts to talk and he, we hear his life story 15 minutes and he the preamble of why he's asking the question and the reason and his perspective and then he gets around finally to asking the stupid damn question. And, it, and it's like, and, I, and we, can, we can appreciate that. If we had the time, it would be fun to do. I mean, I, I would we'd love to hear everybody, but ask the specific question. Like, guys, I got to tell you. There aren't, there aren't any gurus in this place. I can assure you that. I'm. I got sober in 1987, and, and Charlie been sober a long time. Katie been sober a long time, and we we just we want to come up here and share some of our experience with you. That's all we want to do. And we're not. This is not. You know, we didn't come up from Texas to show you you Canadians how to do it. You know, that's not that's not what we're about. That's not what this is. So you're free to agree or disagree with any of this. So we don't need to hear of why you don't agree with what we just said. Ask. The question. <laughs> and we'll give it a shot to answer the question as we see it. And, and you can just throw it right back out the window if you want to. Y'all cool with that? And we'd, we can make some real tracks with that because um, uh, y'all ask great questions. I, um, I, uh, there's a guy named William White down in Florida that wrote a book called Slaying the Dragon. Some of you guys might have read it. It's, it's a great book if you get a chance to, to snag it. Um, uh, he's he written several articles. And, and, and he, some of the articles that he wrote specifically talks about this little window of opportunity. Now, William's been around the recovery community for a gazillion years and wrote extensively uh, with some other uh, authors I could mention and you would know, but it's, it's beside the point. The point I'm making is that he talks about this window of opportunity for alcoholics and addicts to get sober. And I don't know a lot of you guys, y'all heard me speak from the podium before about this, but, you know, I, You know, you get the little newcomer, he comes in and he gets his feet on the ground and he starts to do the work and all of a sudden he explodes. He's just excited as he can possibly be. You with us? And some old geezer over in the corner is making fun of him. Oh, that old old Johnny, he's on a pink cloud now, you know, because everybody's laughing and waiting for him to bust his ass, you know. And that's exactly what Johnny's going to do if he doesn't finish the steps. There's a window that opens for most of us. Bill Wilson experienced it in Towns Hospital. Can you imagine what would have happened in Towns Hospital and Bill Wilson's having his barn burning spiritual experiences and, and, and Dr. Silkworth runs in there and, and shoots him a little Thorazine in his ass to bring him off that high, you know, because he wants to, you know, oh, you don't, we don't want you to get too happy now, you know. You, <laughs> days away from a, from a suicide attempt, but, but, you know, all of a sudden you're feeling some real hope for the first time and, and there's always some pessimist, some pissant pessimist in the room because they're miserable, wants to bring everybody else down. You follow? Guys, this is about excitement, this, this whole idea. But there's this window that we can get through. Now, if we will, if we will work the steps in that window while, while, while we're feeling good, then we can get on some sol- rock-solid ground. We're not going to stay that spiritual high all the time, but we're going to return to that spot a million times the rest of our lives if we can get on some solid ground. Does that make sense, guys? 
That's, that's what we're after. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a time. I know that some of the fellowships that may be in the room with us today, I belong to some of these other fellowships that really, really talk hard about going slow through the work. And, and, and I have nothing against any of those fellowships except that. I think, there's a, I think there's a very strong reason that we need to work these steps rapidly because my experience is this. I, I, I can sit for a period of time and feel pretty comfortable, but when the, uh, the obsession to use that Charlie's going to talk about comes back, I'm going to drink. I'm not going to think it through. I'm not going to call my sponsor. I'm not going to... I'm going to drink. I, I have... I have seven. I have years of experience with that, and and the guys that I sponsor that I get to watch them do the same thing. So I don't keep anybody spo- uh, sober. I mean, this isn't a sponsorship situation, and I'm working with a new guy. You know, you follow. I, I, it's not my job to keep you sober. My job is to get you spiritually connected, and we do that by doing the work. Of Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's that. That's the way we were taught. And so if you can do that, we can understand where the power comes from. It comes from God. And that's one of the issues that we want to talk about later today is that we have a, a whole lot of people that believe that this sponsorship deal is about taking people on to raise. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, Katie said it, used the term last night. I thought it was so appropriate. I'm going to be your life coach. Now listen, I can barely remember to zip my own pants in the morning. I, 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 don't, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not really sure about, about being your life coach. I've never walked a day in your shoe and I'm going to tell you what to do, you know? I, I, this is just ludicrous, and I know a lot of you may, may disagree with that, but my job as a sponsor is to get you through the work at a, at a quick pace to so allow you to have a spiritual experience and have you have a fighting chance to stay sober in this world. And along the line, I can hold you accountable, and that's, that's what we do in, in a sponsorship situation. I'm not one of these guys that take these guys on to raise. And again, we'll talk more about that. Uh, I want to show you a couple of things real quick in this, and then uh, uh, let Charlie get up here. This little circle triangle that I drove, I, I drove Drew up there. I drew up there. What's in the, What's in this stuff? <laughs> this is a little circle triangle. It used to be in the front of our books on the title page of your book where it says that, that the story of how many thousands of men and women have, have recovered ED. Oh, God. Someday before I die, it's going to be the coolest thing to go to a conference and have everybody introduce themselves as recovered alcoholics or just alcoholics. If I never hear the ING word again, it'll be too soon for me. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Why don't you finish the work and get well? We need your help. Let's go. You can recover from alcoholism. we got to stop watering this message down to the newcomer. I, listen, you can hear it. Well, my, my counselor in treatment said that we will always be recovering. Your counselor was wrong. (laughs) Bill Wilson, guys, I don't know how many times. I'm sure we got guys in here that can tell you how many times in the 164 pages it says that you're going to recover. Recover. You either are or you're not. Y'all understand? Guys, that doesn't mean we're better than anybody else. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. We've, we've, we've recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. I haven't obsessed about alcohol or dope in 22 years. Why in the... Now, living daylights, but I want to walk into an AA meeting full of newcomers and introduce myself as someone who is still sick. Bill Wilson in the book, we can show you later, gets crystal clear when he explains it in the book. He says, Inter- this is a quote, introduce yourself to the new man as a person who has recovered. I didn't write it. So why would you want to take the advice of somebody else that may... This is the message that we're supposed to carry, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is what we're talking about. I went to a treatment center one time that told me that I could get well if I just took massive quantities of vitamins. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. They, they seem to help. I was constipated for six months, but they... <laughs> and I drank, but I felt better. <laughs> Y'all understand that? But I'm not going to go into an AA meeting and share that stuff. It's good information. Some of the guys I sponsor, I talk to them about vitamins. We can do that. Y'all understand? 
Let's give the newcomer a clear representation of what the program is about. In 1987, after my suicide attempt, I went into the rooms, and, they, and that not, very night, they opened the, the title page of the book where it had that circle triangle on the book. And we've since lost it in the United States with our copyright stuff. I've got rubber stamps up here. I've already stamped some of your books. And I'd be more than glad to put this stamp back in your book if you'd like it. We'd stamp it. Charlie's got one, too. And, and that's what we do when we travel around because this is the way you can stay in all three parts of this program. A recovery unity service and the old geezer looked at me real quick to go through it he says chris what's recovery and i finally get bumbled around to say the 12 steps and he said that's correct have you worked the 12 steps and i said i'll never forget i said i'm working the steps to the best of my ability <laughs> <laughs> which translates to in layman terms no i'm not working the steps <laughs> this is so much so much crap you know it's like no i'm not i've worked some of the steps he said but that's not what we're talking about have you worked all 12 steps and i said no and he took a little x and x a little little i i was uh, i'm a testing kind of guy don't x me you know and I, he said what's this other piece what's this unity piece and i said that's meetings he said right are you going to meetings absolutely because meeting makers make it and he rolled his eyes and he said yeah okay i'm going to give you that one and he checked that unity he said what service i said our ser our service is making coffee and stuff. He said, that's not, that's not, no. What's our primary purpose? Carry the message to the newcomer. Oh, but you don't have a message, do you? And he exited. it. You follow? I didn't. I didn't. I'm, I'm drinking and my spirit is not awakened. I have no knowledge about the 12 steps. I can't transmit what I don't have. He exited. it. So let me get this straight, Chris. You got a three part problem, three part illness. You got a three part solution and you're in exactly one part and you wonder why you can't stay sober. Guys, any of you guys in this room that are having trouble staying sober, this is why you don't have to look at your stupid issues. You don't have to look at the external stuff. This is why. Because the people that are in all three parts of the program seem to be able to walk through the bad stuff with grace and dignity and come out the other side. Make sense? I, I, it's, I sit in meetings with guys that get diagnosed with cancer and just walk right straight through it and never even think about taking a drink. And I work with guys that haven't worked the steps with us that are not in all three parts. They pull out the sock drawer one morning and can't find two black socks that match and they crumble in oh my God. God hates me. Shh. Gunk, gunk, gunk. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We're going to blade in the sock drawer for that? I mean, I don't know. Come on. Come on. I get to participate. The 12 steps are not a self-help program, folks, but I get to participate in my recovery by working these steps, and I will get spiritually connected. Even if you don't believe in God, you're going to get spiritually connected. And that's just been our collective experience. I, you don't knock it till you try it. One of the reasons I want to show you back over here in this Dallas, uh, these little statistics real quick. This is so not scientific. So any of you guys want to come up at coffee break, let's talk about something else because this is not scientific, okay? we got guys out there beating us up from the podiums talking about these stats that we were talking about for years out here. But we monitored these forever in Houston, Texas, and Dallas. I've got the, I've got the stats that run, but these are the last ones hot off the press. But just to give you a graphic kind of a piece of what's happening in our fellowship because a lot of people out there believe that everything is perfect in our fellowship because they're perfect at our fellowship, you know? But if you pull your head out of your... and look around a minute, you kind of see that things are kind of goofy in places. In places. In Dallas, Texas right there, the, the desire chip count, we sold nearly 17,000 desire chips in 2008. Inner group. Y'all know the little desire chip you pick up? We, we do same stuff in Canada. One month chips, if you stay sober 30 days in Texas, they'll give you a little one month chip, a little red chip. We sold 5,102. You see a slight drop in number there? <laughs> oh my god we've been monitoring these stats since 95 and this and this percentage of drop hadn't changed a dead damn bit one year chips if you stay sober a year we give you a little bronze chip like, like some of you guys showed me yours last night 987 one year chips I've never seen it over a thousand in all the years we've been monitoring it okay you had nearly 17,000 people walk in the room screw their courage up and ask for help and less than 8% managed to make it to the end to pick up a chip. You ought to see what happens after five years, after seven years. Y'all understand this? One of the reasons is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a, it's clear to us is because the, the sense of urgency to finish this work, the clarity in our qualifi qualification process of finding out if the alcoholic is really one of us, you with us? So that, that, that catapults them into this process of getting well. I mean, Guys, in 1955, and the book went into its second at printing, we had a success rate in the United States of 75%. Nobody wants to question those stats. They're real. In 1955, we had 75% getting well. 
In 2008, we have less than 8%. And everybody thinks everything's just great. Oh, they just don't want it. Of course they want it. But in 1955, the newcomer was sat down, the book was opened, and they were explained to, to the newcomer what we needed to do in order to have the spiritual experience. You with us? Nobody was walking on eggshells around this God stuff. Nobody was walking on eggshells around these folks. They were just telling them, guys, this is what we have to offer. You want it? Come on. If you don't, go away. Make sense? We've turned into a social uh, gathering instead of a spiritual program of action. And this is where we kind of need to flip things back, I think. So I got an email real quick. I'll let uh, Charlie up. This, this is from a guy that uh, my buddy down in Florida sent me this email. And he said, uh, and I'm going to delete enough in here so that you can't tell who this is. But they had a speaker meeting with an old geezer in there for about 59 years sober. And from the podium, this guy shared that he's an atheist, that his gambling addiction was worse than his alcoholism. And that quitting drinking isn't rocket science. All you got to do is make up your mind to quit and quit. <laughs> Sister goes, <"Doo!" laughs> And then the little new guy sitting in there going, I can do this. I'll just decide to quit and everything will be okay. To hell with your steps. You know what I'm saying? And it's like you got people all over the world watering this message down. And we as a fellowship have just stood here and watched it. I'm not watching it anymore. I think it was, it was a bunch of us in, in this room I know that are speaking up and trying to make some changes here. Basically, what we want to talk about today is the reasons for this and, and perhaps get us some clarity around what this is about. This is not rocket science. We don't want to make this as com complicated as it can be. I work in the treatment center field, folks, and I know there's lots of people out there that every time you turn around, somebody's writing another book about how to work the steps. <laughs> it's just like, guys, I don't know what to tell you. You know, we had a pretty masterful uh, uh, thing happen here in 1939 when this book was published. The steps are outlined in the first hundred pages. I've got little handouts out here that kind of show where the steps are in the book. If, you, if you've forgotten, you want to kind of take a folder and page and stick it in your book and to help the little newcomer understand what this is about. So uh, this will be fun. Again, at the end of this hour, we'll, we'll, we'll allow you guys to ask some specific questions and then we'll move on. And then uh, before lunch, we should get through the first three steps and uh, we'll see what happens after lunch. Cool. Let's try to be real quick on the breaks, guys. You know, go smoke real quick because, boy, I know how that goes. Uh, uh, Smoke too, but smoke them out there and then hurry back as quick as you can. And, uh, and, uh, and then we can start on time and keep, keep this thing on track. Cool? All right. Here's Charlie. Whew. Thanks, Chris. I don't know where to go from that. There's a lot of good stuff there. I, uh. I really don't like him belittling my sock issues, though. I mean, sometimes, I, sometimes that can be a real problem. You know, I, uh, I'm Charlie. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. Yeah. Sober since March 22nd of 1985. And uh, I love uh, you know, what Chris was saying. And, and um, I really, uh, I like this thing about, you know, what they used to do back then and what we what we do now and we're going to be taking a little different approach to that you know rather than just kind of like talking about the steps and how i would want to experience the steps we're kind of talking about how you would take how i would take a new guy through the steps and sometimes that's a little different and sometimes you know i've taken people through the work you know that are brand new and then up to you know 22 years of sobriety going back through the work and, and there's a significant experience still available for a lot of us in the steps no matter where we're at but um this thing about diminishing returns and stuff you know we uh i really think that back in the uh in the times he was talking about we used to be a, a uh a recovery program with the support fellowship you know we had that we had a recovery pro we had clear-cut directions laid out in the big book and then we had meetings where we would talk about that message, and we would talk about how am I going to carry that message to the new guy? What do I do when he says this? And what if what if he brings up this? And what if he, you know what if he says you know, what do you do? Well, then I go to this page and I talk about this, and and you know the meetings were a lot about that. And then they said, well, we would set aside one meeting a week for the newcomer to talk about his problems and and for everybody to get together. But the rest of the time they're talking about you know how do you know getting in the trenches and and how do we get this message out to you know and growing and understanding and effectiveness as the as the book says and somewhere over the years and if you've sobered up in the in the last 25 years th even in the last 30 years you've come into 
it seems like we've kind of generated into a recovery fellowship with an optional program. You know, I mean, you know, you could just go to the meetings. I, and I don't, I don't really think that Bill and, and the founders and those guys ever dreamed that there would be a time that, that somebody would be able to stay sober just off of going to meetings, you know, and, and, uh, and, and we can for a while. And if you're a real alcoholic, it, it, it worked. Going to, just going to AA meetings will keep one of us sober right up to the point that we get drunk. You know, and and, uh, and now I, you know, and it may stretch it out, and I may blow up a marriage or two, and blow up a few businesses, and and that sort of thing, and you know, constant collision with something or somebody the whole time. But if I'm a, if I'm a real alcoholic, you know, it's the it, trouble's coming, you know, and so just just so that's what we talk like to talk about sometimes, and, and is that. Going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings is wonderful. I love the fellowship of alcoholics. That one side of the triangle that he's talking about, uh, I love it, but it doesn't treat alcoholism. Just going to meetings does not treat alcoholism. If you've got it the way I've got it, so what does? And, you know, so what are we talking about? I love, you know, he referred to this book right where we stamp it. They took this out of the book in, in 1993. They, they didn't ask me about it. They just did it, you know. And, and, uh, you know they, and they really didn't ask a lot of people about it. There were some lawsuits flying around, and they just went, oh, we're, we don't want to engage in any controversy, so they pulled it out of the book. And in my mind, they could have just stopped suing people over it, but it was... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, did I say that? Um, but, you know... We've been putting it back in one book at a time, but you know, I uh, I like, and we do an exercise in our lineage of uh, sponsorship where we check in with the circle and triangle, and you can get an idea of where a guy is real fast by saying, "Where are you at in the circle and triangle?" Go, well, I went to X number of meetings this week and service. I did this and I did that. And I'm sponsoring this many guys, and and uh, and then recovery. Um, you know, if anything, I'm weak in tenth step. I only did like you know four evening reviews this week, and I, you know only did my morning disciplines. You know, and something like that. And you can get an idea of where somebody is pretty quick. So anyway, I'm scattered all over the place. But the, I want to get back to what we're going to try to do is step one in this deal. And I think Katie'd probably like a little time. She. Oh, I'll get time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Katie's, Katie's told me already. She goes, "Oh, I'm in between two bulls here. I can see this is gonna." <laughs> This is going to be trouble. See, we've had times where we've been at a meal, and she'll, uh, she'll probably tell you about it. Katie uh, is uh, generous with her opinion sometimes. And, uh, <laughs> but we'll be sitting at a table, you know, with a bunch of guys, and, and you know, the guy will give his take on something, and I'll give my take on something, and Katie will start. I didn't even realize we were doing it. When one of us started to talk, and then I'm like, I'm going to go get some more salsa. And the other guy gets up to fill his tea, and Katie's like, you sit your ass down and listen to what I'm about to say. I'm an AA member, you know. But anyway, well, you'll see some of that energy this week, and we're going to have some fun. But I wrote up here on the board: problem, solution, program of action. That was the big thing that happened when AA hit the ground. What made AA a big deal was an understanding of those three things: an understanding of the problem, an understanding of the solution. And then a program of action that will bring about that solution. Because if I don't know what the problem is, why would I care about the rest of it? Or, or I might not have the, energy, the level of energy I'm going to need to pursue the rest of it. In fact, Dr. Bob had spent two years in the Oxford movement. He knew the, they had a program of action. Some people call it a six-step program, whatever. Well, they didn't, but whatever you call their, their work. And he... Uh, he knew the solution and he knew the uh, program of action, but he didn't understand the problem. And then if you read about the certain American businessman on page 26, Dr. Carl Jung understood the problem. He told this guy, you got the mind of a chronic alcoholic, and he even knew what the solution was. You know, He says, here and there, once in a while, we've seen people have these uh, spiritual awakenings. He says, to me, these things are phenomena. But he, what did he not have? He didn't have a program of action that would produce that spiritual awakening. You know, it doesn't, it's, it's like if I go out here and uh, my car is, won't start, I, I can't go anywhere. But, but I don't understand what the problem is yet, you know. But, so then let's say I, I look in and I've left the headlights on. Right? Now I know that we've run the battery down. We understand what the problem is. 
Uh, am, I, am I getting ready to drive home? No, because I've still got a dead battery. So what, now what's my solution? Well, we've got to get some juice into that battery. Okay, all right, we need to get some juice in the battery. That's good. Now I know the solution. Still not getting ready to go anywhere, you know. I, uh, but now if somebody, you know, if Chris pulls up and says, okay, I'm going to pull my truck around here. We're going to raise the hoods. We're going to put, I got jumper cables in the back. We're going to put black on black and red on red, and I'll rev the engine up. And you, Well, now we got a program of action that will bring about the solution to my problem. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's talk about the problem in alcoholism because it, it was a big deal. And, and I talked about it a little bit last night. I've been banging my fists together out here for a long time. But it's a two-part illness, you know, and it's, it's in the, the doctor's opinion has some interesting stuff in here. On Roman numeral 26, uh, Silkworth had written uh, an opinion about this stuff, and, uh, and he goes, the physician who gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. Well, if I've been banging around AA meetings for a long time, this might sound like common knowledge, but back then it was pretty revolutionary. Cause, and I don't know, I was kind of that way when I got here. When, I used to feel kind of awkward saying the disease of alcoholism because I knew that I was just kind of a moral weakling and a screw-up and, and, you know, and, you know, disease my butt. You know, you're just trying to let me off the hook here. I'm a screw up. I didn't really understand how, the, what the real problem was. And, um, a lot of people didn't. And, we, and those of you that were here last night, we talked quite a bit about, you know, getting here thinking when I would promise you that I'm not going to drink again and I would drink again and why that is. Well, it says, it did not satisfy us to be told that we couldn't control our drinking just because we were, I love this part, when Chris was talking about being a life coach, it's like, here, uh, I'd like to introduce myself, uh, I'm, I'm maladjusted to life, I'm in full flight from reality, and I'm an outright mental defective, and I'd like to be your life coach. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm incapable of telling the truth from the false, you know, but it says these things were true to some of us. To a considerable extent with some of us, but we're sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. So what are we talking about here? When we get when Chris talks about being a recovered alcoholic, and it's and funny because I've been on both sides of that deal. I can remember when a guy would, would say, I'm a recovered alcoholic, and I think, well, you arrogant SOB, you know, I mean, you don't really understand the, you know, the depth of this disease and stuff. And it's, and like so many other things, I talked last night about, I love to read things that I agree with. I like to, I like to, I'm sure this sets me apart in our fellowship, but I, you know, I, I like to, I like to look for ways that I'm already right. And, you know, and, and, you know, and I become, you know, where no, no more information is coming in because all I can look for is ways that I'm already right. You know, when I'm reading stuff and that sort of thing. And then you explain something to me and I go, oh, you remember Roseanne, Rosanna Dana on Saturday Night Live? You know, and they'd say something to her and she'd go, never mind. You know, I mean, <laughs> but, but it was that way. With that, when they laid out that we're not talking about that I've recovered, uh, that I could successfully drink alcohol again, what we're talking about having recovered from is a hopeless condition of mind and body. And that's the greatest gift God can give an alcoholic like me. When I came into this program, that's all I wanted was out from under. You know, if you, you know, I couldn't get, I came in for the same reason anybody else came in. And no matter how long you've been sober, whether you've been sober a month or, or five years or 10 years or 20 years, Everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous has had day one. We all know what it's like to not be able to get through one day without taking a drink. And that was, that was what got me here. In fact, it wasn't even, back on page 152, it talks about um, one day he'll be unable to imagine life without alcohol. And then, but that's not what brought me into Alcoholics Anonymous. It goes further to say one day he'll be unable to imagine life either with alcohol or without alcohol. It says, then he'll know loneliness such as few men do. He'll wish for the end. He'll be at the jumping off place. That's what brought me into AA, was that I knew I couldn't keep going on drinking the way I was drinking, but I couldn't imagine not drinking. You know, I mean, you know the deal. When the, when the, the girlfriend says, if you don't stop drinking, I'm leaving, 
And I, you know, if you, if, you know, I just remember thinking, God dang! I mean, I, I don't want you to leave. I love you, and I want, I'd like for you to stay. Uh, and I'll taper down, or I'll, uh, maybe we'll do less of this, and we won't do any of that, and we definitely won't do any of that. But God dang, if you're talking about nothing, you're probably gonna need to go. You know, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, <laughs> because I can't imagine life, you know, without you know, on the Nash, you know, and, because I'm so uncomfortable sober. So that kind of, so what? This problem solution program of action is a big deal, but the book, the problem, is such a big deal. And Chris talked on it last night that the, that the bulk of the recovery portion of this is in the first 103 pages of the book and the doctor's opinion. So, like 113 pages is is about our solu- you know, is our whole recovery program. And the, and the back chapters are, um, you know, to wives, family afterward, to employers, and a vision for you about the growth of the fellowship later. But of those 113 pages, over 50 of them focus on the problem. Because if you're a drunk like me, you got to come at me from every possible angle, you know, of escape. Because I'm going to try to wiggle out somehow to not have to be like you. Because if I'm not like you, then I don't have to do what you do. Right? Well, um... In uh, there's another place where it talks about having shared in a common peril. There's just one element in the powerful cement which binds us. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element in the powerful cement which binds us. But that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. This book doesn't wait long to start making promises to me. Right there on that cover page we talked about, it says how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. So what are we talking about recovering from? We're talking about recovering from a hopeless condition of mind and body. And I touched on it a little bit last night. But the shortest version I can give is that, I, like I said last night, I have two problems with alcohol. One happens when I drink it. And what happens when I don't drink it? And it's those two things coupled together that make me alcoholic. What are those two things? It's this physical allergy that the the doctor talks about. If you go to Roman numeral 28, XXVIII, if that's not a mouthful, um, III, it says, we believed and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol in these chronic alcoholics. So who are we talking about here? Chronic alcoholics. We're not talking about little, you know, just have a couple of beers here and there. We're talking about chronic alcoholics. It says the action of alcohol is the manifestation of an allergy. I like to break this stuff down because these are not words that I used getting here. I never used, (laughs) did anybody ever say phenomenon or uh, (laughs) manifestation? You know, I mean, it says it's the manifestation... A chronic alcoholic, a chronic condition, there's acute illness and there's chronic illness. Acute illness is severe, but you can treat it and it'll go away, like pneumonia and some of those things. Then there's a chronic illness like diabetes that you can treat it, you can control it, but it's never going to go away. Does that make sense? So alcoholism is like that. I mean, it's, 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 gonna, it's a long-term deal. It says these chronic alcoholics that the action of alcohol is is the manifestation of an allergy. There's a lot there. A manifestation, all that means is how something shows up, how how something presents itself. And it says of an allergy. And an allergy is just an abnormal physical reaction for our purposes here today. It's just an, an abnormal physical reaction. If 10 people eat strawberries and nine people do fine and and one person their throat swells shut and my eyes close and I can't breathe and you got to take me to the hospital and get a big shot of Benadryl, you'd say, I have a pretty good little abnormal reaction to strawberries, right? So this manifestation of an allergy is how does it show up? I'm also allergic to poison ivy. Anybody else allergic to poison ivy? And, you know, the manifestation of that allergy is that you get a rash and it itches like crazy and if you scratch there and scratch somewhere else, then you got it there. So that's the way... that allergy shows up. How does my allergy to alcohol shows up? 
that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class. Limited to what class? This class of chronic alcoholics, right? So that this craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. This last night I talked about one definition of alcoholism. Here's another one. It says that this manifestation, that this craving is limited to this class of chronic alcoholics and never occurs in the in the average temperate drinker. Never is less than half the time. You know, I mean it's uh it says uh so what is this phenomenon of craving? When I take a drink of alcohol, I've got this weird physical reaction to alcohol that, that I can't control. I can't control it 25 years sober. When I take a drink of alcohol, it triggers a craving for more alcohol. And you know what? It doesn't really matter any what Charlie Parker says or what any, the book even says. If you don't take your own experience and lay it up against what this book is saying and see if it's a fit. When we get as we get into this stuff, just look at it and go, what's it like when I drink? What's it like when I try not to drink? Does this fit? Is this the way it happens when I drink? When I decide to go have a couple of drinks, do I go have a couple of drinks? Or do I blow the whole paycheck? You know, and then when I come out of it, do I swear this is never gonna happen again? And then it happens again? You know, and then so well, we're not gonna I don't wanna spend a lot of time on the phenomenon of craving. Because, it, But it does say the message which can interest and hold these alcoholics has to have depth and weight. I love Alcoholics Anonymous because, because it was the first place I'd ever been around people that were talking to me about my drinking that drank like I did. If you drink like we do, you're used to people wanting to talk to you about your drinking. You know, I mean, there, there were times when people would want to sit down and talk about my drinking, usually right after I'd wrecked a car or lost another job or, or blown something like that. But it was never, my, my mother talking to me about my drinking didn't have any depth and weight because she didn't understand what drinking did for me. Well, down there it says men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while I admit it's injurious, after a while I can't tell the truth from the false. You know how I can't tell the truth from the false sometimes? I'm the guy sitting in his fifth treatment center Go, going, I really don't have it like you got it. I, I, I think I can get out of here and still tweak this thing a little bit, you know, and I got zero evidence to support that. But I can't tell the truth from the false because in my mind, I still think I can get a handle on this. And if you understood all the conditions of how I got into detox again, you'd understand that it wasn't really the booze. It was just, you know, bad luck. Uh, you know, and then and uh, and then it says my alcoholic life seems the only normal one. I thought about this when we were going through customs yesterday, and she was, uh, you know, because at one point in customs, uh, in this last time when we were, uh, they the they go, the guy goes, how many times have you or have you ever been arrested, Mr. Parker? And I was like, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I've told you, but, and he goes, how many times? And I was like. You would have better access to that information than I would. You know, I really don't. But, but you know, when it talks about our alcoholic life seems the only normal one, I was like, what's the big deal yesterday when they were talking about it? And what I use as an example a lot of times about my alcoholic life seems the only normal one. You know, you want to hear something strange about the general population? You know, most people go through their entire lives without ever being arrested. <laughs> Is that is that startling to you? I mean, I mean, if I went to my mother and said, you know, I I got to go see my PO today and give him, a, I got to I got to take a UA because I got a DUI, she would have no idea what I'm talking about, you know. And but for us, that's typical conversation, you know. It's like, you know, well, yeah, I can tell you how to beat a UA, you know. Like, well, so but what happens? We, we can talk a lot about this physical allergy, that when I drink, and I got ample evidence in my history to show that, that when I eat, no matter what my plan is, going into a drinking episode, it never works out like that. You know, I, it, and I used to think that I was just a screw up. You know, like I was saying, that when I would start drinking again and it would get away from me, I thought I was a screw up. I didn't understand that I had triggered this phenomenon of craving that was more powerful than I am. So 
when I would just stop in that night when you guys were here last night when when that, when I talked about when I got that money to go get everything out of the pawn shops and I just stopped by to have a couple of drinks. I didn't understand that I'd triggered a phenomenon of craving, and now I, you know, I've hit my, I've hopped on a train that I can't control where it's going, and, and I spent all the money, and it happened over and over again. Okay, to move forward, this phenomenon of craving, have we kind of figured out, you know, what that is? Y'all pretty hip on that one? It's a big problem. Not my biggest problem, though. But over on page 23, it says these observations, let's turn to page 23, this is a big one. Turn in your hymnals to page 23. Uh, it says, because looking at the body, it, I've got it written in my book right under that first line under there. It says, looking at the body stops here on page 23. Because what does it say after that? It says, these observations would be academic and pointless. I always translate that to mean, wouldn't mean squat. And I don't always say squat. Um, but these observations, what observations? All these observations about my physical reaction to drinking this is, would be pointless if what? If I never took, if, if, if my biggest problem is what happens when I drink, what's my solution? Don't drink. I mean, how hard is that? You know, remember Nancy Reagan's little, uh, just say no program. Does that work for anybody? <laughs> After a while, it's just say yo. You know, uh, you know uh, the difference between my allergy to alcohol and my allergy to poison ivy is that I have never one time in my and I am wildly allergic to poison ivy, but I have never one time been out for a walk in the woods and looked over and gone, ho ho ho. <laughs> I think that's poison ivy, <laughs> you know. And off come, you know, <laughs> off comes my shirt and just roll in it, you know. <laughs> because I don't have a mental obsession with poison ivy, <laughs> you know. When my poison ivy gets away, I don't get so uncomfortable and 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 get to a point where I think that the only thing that's going to make me feel better is poison ivy. But vodka does something special for a guy like me, you know? I mean, how many, I love, uh, Chris's brother talks about how many of us remember our first drink. And I mean, it's it's widespread across the board. And, and he always goes, you remember the first time you ate green beans? You're like, no. Oh, it's because vodka does something special for a guy like me. It's the first thing I'd ever found that would fill that hole. And so... My biggest problem, and, you know, and that's what it says. It says, therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. You know, it's, if you ask him why he went on that big run again, he'll give you some reasons. But in his mind, he doesn't really know why he got loaded any more than you do. That was that thing we talked about. And that is universal. I've talked, you know, everywhere you go, if you say, when they say, why did you start drinking again? We all say the same thing. I don't know. I don't know. You know, well... It's what we're talking about here, is that this mental obsession that happens, and this happens when I'm sober, right? If you go back to Roman numeral 28, he says, They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort. Oh, how nice is ease and comfort? You know, that just that feeling of just, he, Clancy says one time that he described that real well, that feeling of a drink going down and hitting bottom and that, ah, and he said he saw two newcomers get up and leave the back of the room, you know. So, <laughs> but it says that sense of ease and comfort which comes at once from taking a few drinks. You know, they just, you know, that when you're sitting there and you're that just right when it's just kicking in, it's just like, oh, you know, and it says, now here's where it gets tricky. It says drinks they see other people taken with impunity. You, you know what impunity means? It means they don't get punished for it. It's the same root word as punished or punitive. These guys, when they take a drink, 
It doesn't cost them their house and their car and their job and their girlfriend and their dignity and their self-respect and all the values they grew up with. They just go have a couple of drinks. But for me, it triggers something much better. But I get this restless, irritable, and discontent. This is talking about in dry periods. This isn't talking about when I'm drinking. It says, this, you know, and restless, irritable, and discontent, you know, Restless is, you know, after a couple of weeks, I start getting a little jumpy. You know, I mean, I just don't really feel like, I, Bob says it's like a dog that can't find his spot. You know, just circling and circling and circling. And, you know, if I'm inside, I feel like I ought to be outside. And, you know, I just, I just, and then irritable, we don't have to go into too much detail about irritable, but after, you know, you know, I, I like what a friend of mine at Blind Dave at home talks about, you know, they used to say, don't go over to Dave's house, he's drinking. And then after a while they'd go, oh, you don't want to go over to Dave's house, he's not drinking. You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> because, because after two or three weeks of not drinking, I get a little bit irritable, you know. I mean, you know, when you're in the grocery store, and the, the guy in front of me has got 14 items in the 10-item lane. And the reason I know is because I counted every drug drum. <laughs> you, know, you know, and I mean, I just, after a while, and I love the way Clancy describes it where he talks about it's like somewhere in the night somebody stuck in and installed a spring in my gut, and every day it just gets tightened down a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And then discontented is the last stage of it, and that means I just start not liking the deal I'm getting. You know, I don't, I'm not being treated right. I'm not being treated right at work. My wife, the kids, the guy next to me at work, I'm doing all the work, and he's making $3 an hour more than I do, and, you know, and, you know that sort of thing. And after a while, I get thirsty. You know, it, what happens is that spiritual malady, it's a three-part disease. I believe it's a three-part disease. There's some discussion about it out there, but I believe something drives this mental obsession, and the closest thing I've ever come to is that, is that spiritual malady. But the book doesn't discuss the spiritual malady much till we get up into step three. But something makes me so uncomfortable that it triggers that mental obsession. So what happens is, I get so uncomfortable, and when I've had something that has given me relief before in the past, I don't remember consequences when it comes time to take that first drink. When I need relief, I don't think about consequences. Some of those slogans, uh, you know, I've spent I spent some time in AA doing a little slogan slinging. You know, I mean, when I was when I was just in, in the fellowship of AA, and not so much in this book, I had a period where I, you know. And, you know, it's, it's a tough spot. And, I, and it's somebody, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but you know what it's like when, you know, when you're just kind of going to the meetings and not really doing the deal and somebody comes up and says, hey, can you help me? And you're like, well, let's see. Um, uh, I'll put the plug in the jug, right? That's a good one. And, uh, and oh, and don't drink no matter what. That's a good one. And, uh, and, and, and uh, go to 90 meetings in 90 days and take this book and, well, Read, uh, well, just read the whole thing, you know, and, 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 and I'm really kind of hoping they don't call me back because I know at that point I got nothing to give them, you know. And I, so, I mean, I've been on both sides of that. I know what that's like. And, you know, so to, to get, have gotten back into this work and catch fire with it, the coolest thing in the world is when a guy comes up and says, can you, can you put me through the work? And you're like, absolutely. You got a big book? If you don't, we'll get you one, you know. And I mean, you know, let's sit down, and we're not going to take a lot of time at it. I, Chris and I, are, and Katie, we're all on the same page with getting this work done fast. Because if I believe what we're talking about here, I had a guy one time that I'm sponsoring him now, but he was had a different sponsor. We we're out on the golf course, and he told me, he goes, well, you know, my sponsor told me um, uh, this isn't a race, you know. Don't get in a big hurry to work this. This isn't a race, and I was like. It kind of is, you know. I mean, you know, it, it really. I mean, because go back to page twenty-four. Let's go back to page twenty-four. Because it says at a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. Now we all know what's the only requirement for membership in AA. A desire to stop drinking will get me a front row seat in an AA meeting. But it says right here on page 24, it won't do a darn thing to keep me sober. 
It says right here, the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. All right? And it's, the fact is, and I said it last night, if you can make up your mind to stop drinking and pull it off, you don't even have to come to AA. You don't even belong in AA. You know, this deal is not talking about that. It says, the fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. I am unable, this is the key line, at certain times, to call into my consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. And it doesn't matter whether that's my suffering and humiliation or my family's suffering and humiliation. I can't call it to mind with sufficient force to ward off the first drink. It says... I am without defense against the first drink. So it says, I can't call to mind the suffering and humiliation of a week or a month ago, so it implies to me that there is a window of opportunity between that hit and bottom. You know over there where it talks about that terrible cycle? When I come out of that terrible cycle, it says emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. Anybody ever come out of a run like that? <laughs> oh, I feel terrible, I, you know, and I really didn't mean to spend the whole paycheck. And I know you gave me the rent money to run over there, but I just stopped in to see the boys. And, you know, you know, and well, and that firm resolution, it, it says I can't, I've got to, between that time of hitting bottom, and the time this mental obsession comes back, and the mental obsession is going to make me powerless over taking that first drink. And when I take that first drink, it's going to trigger the phenomenon of craving, and then we're off and running again. I don't know what that window of opportunity is, whether it's a week or a month or whatever, to get this guy in touch with the power. But that's that to me, that's our race, is between the time I hit bottom and the time that mental obsession is on me again, I need somebody to get me in touch with the power because my power is not going to get the job done. You know, and that's what we're going to roll into when we roll into step two. But the problem is so important. On page 30, and I talked about it last night, it says, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we're like people, other people, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. So that's what we're doing here, is that I'm not fixing to get a handle. Fixing is a Texas term. It means preparing to. It doesn't, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't mean repairing. It means preparing. So I'm not fixing to get a handle on this deal. I'm not about to turn this thing around, right? And, you know, and so to me... We're about to roll into, you know, when we roll into step two, we spend a lot of time in the problem because it says it's such a big deal for a guy like me to have what I call a step one experience. And if you've ever worked with guys and you see a guy have a step one experience, I mean, I just say guys, a person have a step one experience, it's unbelievable. You know, you got a guy that's been, I've seen it happen with guys that have been banging in and out of treatment for 18 years. And you, I had a guy come up to me one time and he goes, I have never heard the stuff you're talking about. I've been in AA for 18 years. I've never put together more than six months. I've never heard anybody talking about the stuff you're talking about. And it explains, just like we said back in the doctor's opinion, it explains a lot of stuff I've never been able to explain. You know, and so... Uh, it's, it's critical stuff. And, and, you know, the first seven pages of working with others talks a lot about how we, how we make this first visit to the guy and what we talk about. And so, but, it, but it talks about going back and, and having an understanding of this thing because it's, it's just critical that I be able to break down. And Chris talks about qualifying the new guy. It's a, it's a touchy topic uh, in AA, but... I don't think it's fair to just because the guy shows up in an AA meeting to assume that he's one of us. You know, am I done? You're done. Okay. Well, um, yeah. I. Uh, so anyway, that's. I mean, that's my thought is that you know we have that X amount of time to get this guy in touch with the problem because the thing about the problem is it drives me through the rest of the work, right? If I if I have that step one experience where I understand to the core of my being that on my own, I got no shot, then the rest of this work gets really interesting. Does that, does that make sense? 
Uh, I'd like for my lovely wife to come up and. Uh, 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 uh. Well, I think I have. I think I have seven minutes. I got fifteen. <laughs> What, what could a woman know in Alcoholics Anonymous, huh? Uh, I'm Katie. I'm a grateful, recovered alcoholic. I swear to God, you women know, boy, when we run with the boys, we, we, we just have to kick your ass. We really do. And uh, I told Charlie, I said, uh, and, and Chris is, Chris, well, Chris loves me. And that's a good thing. And my husband loves me, but he and I can go toe to toe because the truth of the matter is, 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 um, I suffer from alcoholism. I got the bug. I got the deal, but I'm also running against boys and anybody knows that that's tough. I'm not kidding you. I can sit there with the boys at a table and I, I, I'm, I'm waiting to get in, I'm waiting to get in, I'm waiting to get, and then when I get in, they shut it down. And it pisses me off. <laughs> and here's the deal. I got the power. I'm telling you, I got the power. So, God dang. We got over there get constantly giving the stink eye. So here's the deal. I'll just sweep it up. Oh, I'm aware how much time I have. <laughs> So, uh, you guys can imagine, and, and I swear, I know the girls are out there just going, thank God we got a ballsy chick up here, man. <laughs> uh, so here we go. We're all grateful, honey. I know, I knew you would be. I knew you would be. I've been sober since, uh, uh, October the 28th of 1984, and for that I am very, very grateful. Uh, I, I will tell you guys, in, in 25 years of sobriety, though, uh, Charlie and I are real, real open to tell you we absolutely were middle of the road. We absolutely were meeting based sobriety. I had no idea that's what I was. Did not have a clue. I had no idea I wasn't carrying the message. I had no idea I wasn't working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, oh, you'll find out fast enough, right? I mean, either you're going to want to kill yourself or you're going to want to drink. I mean, it's, you, you got two options. And, and you're really quite shocked when they happen. That, you, that you're at that feeling. But the truth of the matter was, is I, I could not have sponsored a new guy, period, at 15 years sober. I had no idea how to take a new guy through the work. And that's what, when we, when we come and do these things, we're here to teach you, just like we were taught, how to take the guy through the work. It, it's all about teaching and passing on, right? And so there's tons of CDs out there, and there's there's great teachers that are, are good at the way that they word things. Some people connect more with others. But the truth is, is if you don't learn how to do it, then you've got nothing. I mean, it's not like all of a sudden you went to sponsorship school, right? And and one day, you you know, people go, well, I'm, I don't think I'm ready. Bullshit. You're just scared. You know, you absolutely are ready. And I'll tell you what, your pride and your ego will force you to get into the work. When somebody comes to you and says, you know, I need help. Now, I'm not talking about the complete middle of the road guy that does not have, is not armed with the facts. But I'm talking about you guys sitting here. You, you knew who you were coming into. You guys knew that if Chris was going to be here, you were going to go ahead and get your, your, your butt kicked a little bit. Or you're on, a, on, our, on our team type deal, right? And, uh, and so... What you have to do is you get out there and your pride and ego will keep you in the work. If somebody comes to you with a question, you're going you're gonna to find out the answer, right? So you may not do it for yourself, but there, they, so that's not a bad thing about our ego to get involved. Um, my husband does such a fabulous job at the first step, and I really do give him a hard time about, you know, giving me a few minutes. But the truth is, is I love his first step. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of Chris. I love that Chris steps out here and talks about the truth, and he does it in a way that I admire. Uh, so my job is just going to really sweep up the first step only because they've already given so much about it. But I, I want to talk about consequences do not keep us sober in this program. And there is such a strong misunderstanding of um, people coming in saying, I need to get sober for my kids, or I need to get sober to do this, or I need to get sober to do that. And uh, consequences are not a bad thing. 
I'm telling you, none of us came in here just because we burnt the toast. You know, I mean, consequences brought us in here, right? We had people on our ass telling us, you better get sober. The only thing is, it will not sustain sobriety, but it'll get my attention. And so consequences aren't that a bad thing. And when you're working with a new guy, you've got to let, you've got to identify all of those things. You know, when they say, well, you know, my, and I, I'm such a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a girl, but I think I'm a boy, but, um, I always refer to guys because the program is geared to guys speaking, right? But I, I mean men and women, but I, I'll refer to, you know, the, 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 the guy comes in and says he's going to lose his wife just because that's how we're all raised with the book. But the truth of the matter is, is a woman comes in and predominantly she's going to say they're going to take my kids, you know, and, and wouldn't that be wonderful if that would keep me sober? How, how heartbreaking, that makes me just want to cry. How heartbreaking is that? that I cannot stay sober and you're going to take my children. And I work with women uh, at Family House. That's really my passion. I got sober when my daughter was five. And uh, they lose their kids. One chick left out of there because they wouldn't give her her cell phone. She walked away from two of her children. That was it. That was her done deal. She was off, off the record. Kids gone, period. It's heartbreaking. And, and, you know, you really want to see, you really want to see the rubber hit the road, man. You, you sit there and Charlie goes out there and works with the guys and they're out there doing yoga, <laughs> lifting weights, you know, and you have yeah, volleyball. And, uh, Charlie goes, my wife's over there working with the girls. They got a kid on their lap and one in their belly. You know, he said, you guys got it easy. And, I, and I'm not downplaying it, but boys, don't don't get me wrong. You you got heartache and pain that comes from children too, but uh, I'm talking about in treatment. You know the the different environment, and uh, uh, you got these gals sitting in here, and they said, "Man, they're going to take my kids if I don't get sober." Well, you better be armed with some facts if you really want to help this gal. And I brought in, you know, when I was uh, kind of getting the message and coming back in, man, I was trying, like I said, that ego was really, really pushing me into looking into the book and trying to help these guys. And I, I brought a middle of the road gal with me and didn't know it, right? She wanted to get back into the work. And so we're sitting there and I'm beating them with the allergy and I'm beating them with the mental obsession, you know, and, and they're sitting around listening. And, and then I let her share, which I will never do again. And... Um, uh, now I run the meeting solely, and uh, she says, you know, just don't drink. And I swear to God, it was as if, I, I remember the girls go, that's all I got to do? And it was kind of like what you said, Chris, about those gears. Is uh, You know, I went in there and, sh you know, told them this is what you got to do, this is what you got to do, it's going to be some work, it's going to be tough, it's going to be this, it's going to be that, you're giving them hope and all of that stuff. And she comes in with just don't drink. And this one girl goes, I'm going to put a big sign up on my refrigerator. And I swear to God, I wanted to slap the crap out of her after that. You know, I thought, God dang it. You know, stop. Now, granted, she didn't know any better. You know what? So it was my job to teach her. But I did. By God, after that thing was said and done, I really told her. I was like, I, I can't believe that was what you brought. I, I mean, I, I'm just coming out of this um middle of the road stuff too, but I know better than to just say that. Well, I wrote down a couple of things here and, and, uh, um, uh, I, and I'm going to jump all over the place now, but one, one of the things is too, when you're working with that new guy is <clears throat> the qualification is, is crucial. It really is. And it's dicey, but you know what, when I'm one-on-one -on -one with you, I don't care. It's, I'm not going to sit there and lob it out and in an AA meeting about qualifying a guy because I'm going to just get hit with arrow after arrow. But I will, when I sit down with the, with the individual, I will qualify them because the truth of the matter is, is my sister is not alcoholic. My sister is very untreated Al-Anon. But you, you can pour enough booze in her to get her a DWI. Right. And, uh, and the judge is going to tell her she's going to have to have some, some AA meetings. And she's an untreated Al-Anon, so what does that make her? She loves us, right? And you get an untreated Al-Anon that you poured enough booze in, and they come into an AA meeting, and we're their drink, right? And they like it in here. They like it a lot in here. They like the, the alcoholic, like them lots. So uh, they stay, right? 
but she's not an alcoholic. And, and, and she is rah, rah, sis, boom, bah, you know? I mean, on an energy level, we can smell a drunk, can't we? As a matter of fact, if I really like you in AA, that's the highest compliment you can have. <laughs> I mean, I, I, actually, the highest compliment is when I tell you I would have drank with you. That, that's... <laughs> and, and that's what we're talking about. But have you ever sniffed out the one where you go, no, that's, that's not even a drunk, man. Oh, uh-uh. They are not alcoholic. <laughs> stay away, stay away. Code red, left hand side, nerd. <laughs> um, uh, the other the, here's another tip too. Uh, the uh, when, when I'm when I'm speaking allergy, I go out every week and I do a first step. My, I go I go into a treatment center. Fortunately, we have the ability to go into treatment centers and and carry the message. Uh, uh, and we do, Charlie and I are firm believers of beating that first step into them, beating that first step into them. We're not going to come in there and, and share our story over and over and over because these folks are, are, are lucky to get any book in treatment. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking, but it's the facts, and it's the way it is in Texas. And uh, so we're in there, you know, beating the first step, beating the first step. And the way I explain the allergy is um, they have, most people have never heard the allergy. They don't have a clue about the allergy. They don't have a clue about the mental obsession. They just drink too much or do too much drugs. They don't get how the whole thing works. So when you're explaining the allergy to the new guy, I use it as like a tomcat. And I said, the truth of the matter is, is if, or excuse me, a cat. I said, if you're allergic to cats, you're, you're, you're the person who says, man, uh, you know, Mary, come on over. Hey, do you have any cats? I'm allergic to cats. You know, you're, you're verifying all of this ahead of time before you go over there. Now, here's the deal. If you're allergic to cats, it doesn't matter if that cat is a tomcat or Persian. It's still a cat, right? And, and one of the things where people get confused, especially the new guys, they say, my drug of choice. And you go, man, I don't know about you, but I mean, I know what I spent my money on but I'll do whatever you got, you know, you pull out anything and I'll take it. What what do you think? What do you think that is? Okay. I'll try it. You know, I mean, there, there was no, there was no, Oh, you don't know exactly what that is. I mean, after about 15 minutes, somebody's going, so what's happening? I don't know yet. I can't really give me a minute. And, uh, so, you know, the, the out for me, I got the allergy to anything that alters my mind. If it's going to alter the way I feel, I want it, right? And so I always try to tell them, you know, because they're, they're in, in treatment, they, they get that whole drug of choice. And I love the way Mark said, drug of choice is Advil. You choose on a daily basis. If you have a headache, you might take it. And if you don't, it stays in the cabinet, you know. But there is no choice in what I'm going to do. And so, you know, when we're talking about triggering that allergy, you know, the, the, for me and you guys that have been, you know, around a while, you've got uh, you've got the guy sitting in Alcoholics Anonymous who is not doing any work, right? Hadn't read his big book, really doesn't have a sponsor doing meeting-based sobriety. He has no clue how close to the edge he is, and this is how his allergy is going to manifest. He all of a sudden, you know, bites into something, breaks a tooth, and he has to go get some dental work, right? No big deal. Broke a tooth, dental work, kind of expensive, but not good. And the doc says, well, you're going to need a little Vicodin. He goes, oh, I am going to need a little Vicodin. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, so he takes that Vicodin. He's walking around with the malady all over him, right? He's the, he's the person in the meeting that's grumpy and pissy and hates everybody and blah, 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 and triggers that allergy. And the next thing you know, he's rescheduling for more dental work. See, that's what we're talking about, an allergy, is if, if you're sitting around with that malady, you're not doing anything. I don't care if you got 30 days or 30 years. That allergy is just sitting there waiting. If you trigger it. Now, if you have, if you're, if you are spiritually fit and you have to have medication for something, I believe God makes that into medication. I really do believe that. And I believe that when you take it, it doesn't even feel good. I can't wait to get off of it. It's kind of creeping me out. Isn't that shocking? Yeah. I don't get that, but it does. 
And uh, and a lot happens in 25 years, you know what I mean? Okay, I gotta wrap it up since, you know, my husband took up all my time. And, uh, <laughs> but let me think, let me think, let me think. Uh, oh, and here's another thing I wanna tell you. When, you. when you're working with that new guy, right? Because this is what this deal's about, teaching you how to sponsor that new guy. You know, you're, you're qualifying him, you're getting him into this deal. One of the things, another term I like to use with them is, is when we trigger that allergy, once again, that allergy is crucial that they get that. that it's not the only problem, because if it were the only problem, all we would need would be detox, right? Just remove me from the booze, but we got a mind that's always gonna take us back to the booze. And here's the deal. When I, I always get them to show a raise of hands in treatment as to how many of them have been through treatment more than once so that they can see that treatment is not treatment for alcoholism. It's merely a reprieve, right? You're going to get 28 day reprieve and you damn sure better do these steps because you got no shield when you step out there. But because the way that ego rebuilds and we'll talk more and more about that. But, um, the, um, okay. Oh, damn it. Lost my train of thought. Okay, the allergy. Like show of hands. Okay, honey. <laughs> he loves me so much. Uh, give me a second. Give me a second. The allergy and the <sighs> obsession. Give me a second. Uh huh. And they have the allergy, and they get removed from the allergy, and oh, oh okay, got it. Thank you, thank you. Okay, here it is. And so when they go, when they get out, they go, you know what? It was bad, but it wasn't that bad because the ego has rebuilt, right? And I mean, things are kind of getting tough and that spring is tight. And so I'm just going to have a little, right? And so what happens is they have forgotten the allergy. And when they drink a little or do a little of whatever their outside issue is, they trigger that allergy, but the way they think it goes in their mind is that they've changed their mind, that they've decided to just have a couple more. Yeah. See, and so when you're working with the new guy, that's, that's an important way to explain what that looks like. So when you guys stop to go just have a few drinks today, I mean, I know I was in treatment and I know everybody's watching me, but I'm only going to have two drinks this time, just two beers. That's it. And they trigger that allergy and they think they've changed their mind to have four. But in fact, they've triggered that allergy. So when you really start talking to them that way, I mean, these lights start going off in that new guy and it's unbelievable. And then the one last thing I'm going to say is, you know, the book talks about in every, um, almost every promise in the book, there's, there's really ugly promises, right? It says it gets worse, never better. That's a promise, right? God, that's got three weeks. It, it gets worse, never better. And that's the truth. And that's important for that new guy to know that there's promises that are of great hope in this book. And there are some ugly promises. But the one thing, too, is it always talks about peace of mind, that we will have peace of mind. Never says we're going to have a big fancy car and great job and people love us, ticker tape parade. You know, and when I walk in a room, everybody's going to go, hey, Katie. <laughs> but it says we will have peace of mind, right? And that is that ease and comfort that comes from the first drink, right? That's what Chris was talking about last night. I, all I want is this thing to shut up. I want that peace of mind. And what ends up happening is we're used to taking a couple of drinks. Little do we know we've triggered the allergy and we're going to wreck the bus. But we can't, see, we overshoot the mark. Right. And so I just want those couple of drinks for that ease and comfort. And the book promises me peace of mind almost after every step, which is pretty cool. And uh, so now are we not going to do the questions and answers now? We're going to do a five minute break to pee and smoke. Pee and smoke. And thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.